Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. So, President Putin is such a genius that just days before his presidential election and just 100 days before Russia hosts the World Cup, he tries to kill two Russians, one of whom lives in Moscow and could have been strangled there for nothing with her own scarf, the other of whom could have been killed in a Russian prison or at any time since or later, using a weapon known to have been invented by Russia in England, in public, in broad daylight, for no purpose, yet even speculated upon, pure genius. They say it was a nerve agent called Novichuk, or Newcomer, which was developed by the former Soviet Union in the 1980s. Its formula long ago ceased to be secret. Its inventor now lives in the United States, and a version of it no doubt resides in Britain's own nerve agent's weapon base at Porton Down, which, as coincidence has it, is just seven miles from the scene of the crime in Salisbury. We know the nerve agent was present in the British agent's house because that is said to be where the brave police officer, Detective Sergeant Nick Bailey, was affected. We know that the substance affected nobody in the Salisbury pub and restaurant visited by Mr and Miss Skripal. Neither did it affect the doctor who treated the couple on the park bench for half an hour. Yet it affected the British spy and his daughter all right, and they remain in hospital in a critical condition, though stable. So a murder plot in which nobody yet died, but which has set Britain on a collision course with Russia. It reads like a plot of a spy novel, as indeed it may well be. Joining us on this edition of Sputnik is former Kremlin and Russian government advisor, best-selling novelist, redoubtable media commentator, Alexander Nekrasov. Alexander, welcome on the Sputnik. These are dark days for British-Russian uh, relations and dark, of course, indeed, to the victims uh, of the attack in Salisbury. Uh, did, did this come out of the blue for you? Uh, was this uh, a course of action that you could have predicted? And if you could have predicted it, maybe there's something in that, that this is all a script, this is all a narrative, pre-prepared uh, for some ulterior political motives. Well, George, I think it was a... It, it looks like a badly prepared provocation. I know it's like the people behind it didn't really think it through properly. First of all, the target. Now, you mentioned in your opening word that it's strange that they would pick this man who was exchanging a spy swap and his daughter, of all people, who came from Moscow. And, as, and by, by the way, not the first time she came to visit him. So that particular bit was not thought through at all. And it would be very difficult to explain to anyone who is going to accuse Russia uh, or be involvement that why they pick these people. So this was a surprise for me. Now, I was a former spin doctor for the Kremlin, the first one actually in Russia. And I can tell you, I sense those small things when I see this sort of charade played out. So you can see where the problem comes from and where they will have a hell of a time proving their point. Now, this first thing I said is, is the target. Wrongly, wrongly chosen completely. Second point, the uh, assertion that because it's the Novichok nerve agent, that means Russia is behind it. Excuse me, seven miles away is the biggest uh, chemical warfare center in the Europe, no, important down. Now, they have samples of this particular nerve agent, have had them for years. Why? Because they needed to pro produce the antidote. Otherwise, you can't do it. Yep. We were even informed by some experts in chemical warfare that the antidote was given to Mr. Skripal and his daughter. So, which means it was given from Porton down. So immediately, the trail goes not to Russia, but to Porton down. Although, I must say, it might lead to other laboratories in America, in Europe, well, all over the world. 
what I have read in the papers, what I have seen on television, goes beyond parody. These are journalists who are saying things as if, first of all, they're reading from the same script because in the same words and sentences, mm. which is a bit strange. <laughs> Secondly, there is no logic in their reporting. And what I found on the first day when they started sort of aggressively attacking Russia is that they started saying things like, well, it's not even proven, it's not yet proven, but everything shows that it's Russia. Mm -hmm. Look at the pattern. Which pattern? What pattern? Things were, st they were starting to write and say things like, oh, remember Litvinenko? Well, I'd like to remind people that Litvinenko case was closed quickly and they decided not to talk about it. The British government even made secret most of the things about it because there were, let's say, suspicious circumstances with Lithuania. Then came Boris Berezovsky. Oh, this, this oligarch died, uh, committed suicide, but we think he was you know, killed by the Russians. Boris Berezovsky was bankrupt. Boris Berezovsky wrote a letter to Putin saying, forgive me, please, and let me come back, and I will tell you everything that happened with Litvinenko, and I will tell the world. So why would the Russians <laughs> kill a man <laughs> who is saying to them, I, I, forgive me for what I, I've done, and I'm coming back? So, but it is all presented as what if this timing, there is a pattern. Uh, Alexander? Because this is a third uh, in the triptych of reasons to disbelieve. Uh, the daughter, as I said, could have been murdered uh, in a dark street in Moscow with her own scarf at a cost of absolutely zero, political but why and also, financial. why did she have but, to be involved? Uh, why, of course, is another uh, matter. Uh, the scripple could have been killed when he was in prison, could have been killed at any time in the last years he's been living in England, but most significantly, if they wanted to kill him, why wouldn't they wait till after the World Cup? Why would they create such... Uh, a crisis, international crisis, uh, on the threshold of what was supposed to be the showcasing of the new Russia? Well, my personal opinion in this case is that the people in Britain, the politicians, Westminster and others, they are in trouble. They need the distraction. There are so many problems that have come up ranging from corruption with, you know, Karelian, uh, Capita, you know, government contracts being given to companies that were going down, no names are given, no ministers are mentioned. Then, of course, the paedophile scandals, they are getting out of control. There are people saying that they de will demand investigation into Telford, into Rotherham again, and, to, and, and you know, dozens of cities are mentioned. This is not good for Westminster. And then the, the small matter of Brexit. <laughs> uh, well, the Brexit, I wanted to come uh, late, uh, third because there's a very interesting connection with Brexit. Mm. Brexit was presented by the Remainers as something that Russia helped to achieve. So tarnishing Russia tarnishes Brexit mm. automatically. Maybe not directly, but indirectly. This whole attack on Russia is an attack on Brexit because Russia is supposedly was the main behind instigator. The Russia you know, is behind everything. Yeah. Behind, but yeah, but there, they are now investigating again whether Russians were helping Brexit, you know, on the, on the internet, whether there were funding and so on. So yes, indirectly, it's an attack on Brexit. But this is part of the paradox, one of many. Uh, they, 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 they say that uh, President Putin is this Mephistophelian genius who can rig elections in the United States, influence people in Sunderland and Swansea to vote for <laughs> Brexit, uh, move the Catalans to demand uh, independence and so on. Yet this genius is also so stupid that he carried out this uh, double hit. Speaking uh, of so stupid, um, these were spies under the protection of Britain, right? No one has questioned that matter. So well, much under protection they uh, were. If, that... if MI6 offered me protection, I think I'd say, no thanks, I'll take my chances <laughs> exactly. with, the, with the village uh, Bobby. But the other paradox, of course, deals with RT. On the one hand, they say, 
Uh, nobody watches RT except conspiracy theorists and extremists and so on. But on the other hand, they say, uh, we simply can't allow RT to continue. Uh, yeah. because Presumably oh. because so many people are watching or it. Even be well, I would like to say a word of, of uh, defense uh, for the conspiracy theorists, if I may. The conspiracy theorists emerge not because people are stupid, but because they don't trust the government. Since the Iraq war, uh, the credibility of the British ruling elite and its media and its political class has plummeted, and that's what Brexit was all about. Plummeted is putting it mildly. Yes, can uh, I, can the, I say the bottom has <laughs> fallen out of it. Uh, we can assume that this war with Russia, now declared, uh, will not go hot. Uh, but there was someone on the floor of the House yesterday, a Tory MP, calling for a cyber attack from Britain yes. on mm. Russia. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> uh, it's, it's going to get very nasty now, isn't it? Well, first of all, the cyber attacks against Russia are going on, have always been going on. If you remember the NSA scandal, remember what transpired, that practically even the president's mobile phone, that was President Medvedev, was hacked by the NSA and, by the way, by the British. Mm -hmm. So what, what were... I mean, I, can, I cannot understand one thing. If the Russians are the only ones who are aggressive, who are, you know, involved in cyber wars, they're hacking, they're doing... What is the American 44 billion a year CIA doing? Are they doing anything? Because that's what I find remarkable, that all these Russians are everywhere, listening, hacking in, doing things. And where's the MI6? Where's the CIA? Where's another 149 American intelligence agencies? Their budget astronomical. Uh, nearly, nearly what? Uh, billions and billions. I, I, I think it's a trillion dollars. So we are witnessing a very strange campaign when all the intelligence services of the West are being downgraded to idiots who are just watching in Passively, awe. Yeah. No, in awe, these Russians and doing nothing. I'm sorry, I, I don't buy this. <laughs> this is absurd. <laughs> Forgive me while I check my watch and uh, my wallet. Alexander Nekrasov, thanks for joining us. Thank on you, George. Sputnik. Always a pleasure. It's topsy turvy in Washington, and we're talking Trump after the break. Welcome back to Sputnik. Rex Tillerson, the billionaire oil man turned diplomat, has been jettisoned by President Donald Trump. And a woman has been appointed to head the CIA for the first time. Will it henceforth be kinder and gentler? According to Fox News, it's case closed in the congressional investigation into collusion between President Trump and Russia. What does it all mean? To help us understand, we're joined by Republican abroad, Sage, American broadcaster Charlie Wolf. Charlie, Charlie you're fired. Uh, the uh, was the tweet uh, effectively for Rex Tillerson. They say he learned of his sacking uh, by tweet. Um, if you were doing the report cards, uh, what would you what would your marks out of ten be for Rex Tillerson's time? I'd probably give him a B minus. I mean, to be fair, it was it was still quite a fine to get someone of that caliber of business. Into the uh, into the State Department, and that really said something in the beginning that we were, you know, getting that kind of talent. Talent you wouldn't normally see, you know, as, as, as in government. Uh, yeah, as, 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 as uh, Steve Norris, who was a former uh, minister, and was it, under Margaret Thatcher, or was uh, he John Major? Uh, under Major, uh, we worked in he worked in broadcasting like he was well, and and he left the uh, the parliament. And I said, why, Steve? He said, I want to spend a bit more time with my money. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably the same thing. Tillerson is going to be all right. He won't yeah, need, I don't a, think he won't he'll need be, yeah. a severance payment. No, government But of pension. course, the conspiracy theorists are, uh, are out and uh, running around like headless chickens. It's yeah. all over Russia, apparently. Hmm. Uh, it was because Tillerson fingered the Russians for the Salisbury nerve agent attack, hmm. and Trump didn't like that, didn't want to yeah. do that, and therefore fired them. Is that true? That's what the press is reporting. Um, now, whether that's because there's some sort of collusion going on, that's a different story. I don't think there, there's something like that. I, I mean, I was a little surprised the other day when uh, the president hadn't come out with the others to condemn. But then again, that fits him with his style. You never know what he's up to. He may you know, be taking an approach of, well, instead of getting up front and throwing barbs and, and, and you know, slings and arrows, 
I'll, I'll hold back and better. I will talk to Mr. Putin privately and see what's going on. Um, you know, maybe his way or, you know, he, he, he just does things differently. And I think that we saw in Tillerson and, and the president, two men that just could not get on the same page. Undoubtedly, uh, mm. Trump is a capricious uh, man who acts instinctively, whatever you think of his mm. instincts. And for, he, him, and for him, it works, to be fair. I mean, for him, well, it, it, it certainly put him in the White House. So <laughs> in that sense, it's uh, worked. And his small family farm is, is worth a few shillings. Uh, but the, the uh, president has hit back now saying that this was about the Iran deal, mm. that Tillerson was against him on the Iran deal. Yeah. Is this all revealing quite a bit of infighting going on uh, inside the Trump administration that wasn't necessarily visible to the general public. I think, again, it was just two people not on the same page. Infighting in and of itself is not bad. I, I mean, there were administrations that needed a bit more infighting. <clears throat> I think, for instance, uh, you think back to uh, the Bay of Pigs and, and, and Kennedy. Uh, that was a case uh, where, um, I'm trying to remember, Eisenhower specifically you know, asked him afterwards, and after that failure, he said, to you, did you, what did you do? You know, how did you come up to this decision? He said, well, I spoke to McNamara, and I spoke to you know, the different names. He said, well, they're all in the same room. He said, oh, no, I called them up. And, you know, and, and uh, he, you know, Eisenhower, being a former president in the privacy of the Oval Office, berated him, as, as only he was allowed to do, you know, saying, well, no, that's not what you do. You want them around the table, and you want them fighting, and you want to see, you know, who's going to come out on top. Uh, you know, before you make a decision. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Donald Trump is good at that uh, in getting people fighting, and, and, you know, and it has worked to, to a large extent. Uh, I mean, even over the, uh, uh, what was it recently, the, uh, the tariffs, uh, a large portion of the cabinet was, or, uh, or of his advisors, uh, Cohn especially, were not in favor of it. Cohn's the economics advisor. Yeah, he's the economics advisor. I think even Stephen Moore, who uh, was uh, former from the um, Wall Street Journal, I think he was against it. I mean, and, and that is kind of classical economics to be against protectionism. Um, but, uh, you know, he's you know, jumping too far into a different topic. Let's go back to this uh, Tillerson sacking, especially the Russian mm. angle. Mm. Uh, you're not unaware that Britain at the moment is consumed uh, in, a, in a, frankly, surprising level of vitriol mm. uh, between Britain and Russia, and no doubt next week between Russia and Britain, because Russia won't take it on the chin. I'm pretty sure uh, about that. The same in your country. Mm. Uh, Trump just can't shake the snow off his boots. Mm -hmm. uh, how significant, therefore, is the congressional finding from the Republican side that it's case closed on the issue of collusion? I think it's more so than you'd find on the Democratic side. Uh, because, again, there has been never any shred of evidence of any kind implicating the president in any form of collusion. And I, I, I would even go so far as to say, th now, there's been some stuff with underlings that have pled guilty to, to things. But, again, I don't think that's collusion that's been, you know, when you go through someone's dirty laundry looking for one thing, you're sure to find, you know, even if it's not, you know, if you're... Stuff is relatively clean. You'll still find something somewhere if you look hard enough. Um, but you know, even if you count uh, the, the the thing with uh, was it uh, uh, Donald? Uh, with, no, it was Eric, wasn't it? With the uh, the meeting he had uh, looking for uh, the, the stuff of the dossier on, on Hillary. I mean, that was maybe a bit dumb, but it wouldn't be right up in that league of, of collusion. So I just don't see it, that it's there. But the Democrats have been kicking on with this because it just it makes a great distraction. So it's a little different than here, where you know again. Uh, you know, you think about it, and it really only dawned on me last night. This is more than just, you know, being, uh, you know, murdering a, a former spy, you know, carrying out extrajudicial justice um, uh, or injustice, as the case may be, on foreign soil. But this is using chemical weapons, essentially chemical weapons, you know, using polonium in the case of Litvinenko. Um, you know, so on that alone, this is something that generally most nations find abhorrent, that we're supposedly trying to stop at all costs. You know, you think... Uh, back to the Assad regime, and again, with help probably from Mr. Putin. Uh, so that's what I find a bit worrying, is, you know, how do you respond to something of that level where, you know, you separate out the other stuff, the, the politics and the machinations and the 007 and all that sort of stuff, and say, wait a minute, this is, again, the use of 
Well, I've got, Russia, of course, completely denies any involvement mm, yeah. uh, in this. And uh, just to quote you from earlier about collusion between Trump and Russia, not a scintilla of evidence has yet been presented that any of us can see. And we fell out of love with accepting the word of intelligence uh, experts mm. uh, after the Iraq war, when yeah, they told yeah. us just as vehemently uh, certain stories that led us into a war that has turned out to be uh, a disaster. So the jury's out to some extent uh, on that. But the congressional case being closed doesn't, of course, close Mueller. What can you tell us about Robert Mueller's apparently still dedicated pursuit of President Trump? It's a hard one to figure because one of the things that I've, I've never liked about the, uh, the special prosecutor role in general is, uh, you know, yes, follow the evidence and find whether someone is potentially guilty or innocent, whether charges should or should not be brought against somebody. But what happens in a lot of these cases is they have such a wide remit uh, that it's suddenly, well, we couldn't find them on this thing, but I, I want to make sure that I'm worth my money. You know, I'm worth my pay and worth my reputation. You know, I think back to Scooter Libby, uh, who was the uh, uh, was the chief of staff or assistant to uh, uh, to uh, to Vice President Cheney over the Val Valerie Plame uh, case. Now, it was clear that no one had leaked, or at least not Scooter Libby had leaked her name as a CIA agent. Matter of fact, the person who had was Richard Armitage, who was a Democratic uh, a civil servant, as, as memory serves correct. But what finally happened was, I guess, he had given the special prosecutor a date of, of a certain meeting, and from his memory, got it wrong. You know, so he had one date, the journalist had another date. And for whatever reason, the special prosecutor said, ah, Jahuz, you know, the dates don't match up. You're the one who's guilty. Not the journalist, or not a mistake. You're the one who's guilty, and, you know, ended up, I think, going to prison, if Libby, I remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Libby went what, to yeah. Uh, prison on that point. Are you expecting uh, Mueller to bring criminal charges against anyone? And if he does, of course, given the extraordinary tariffs that are imposed by American courts, it's quite easy, actually, to flip people. Mm. Quite easy to say, well, you could spend the next 99 years in Sing Sing, or you can sing to us. You can sing to us, yes. Uh, that must be a clear and present danger to the administration. It always is. I'm sure it always is, because, again, you will, you will, if you look hard enough, you will find, as, as my, my intern has said uh, uh, when I saw him recently, uh, actually a couple of years back, he showed me his private practice. He says, oh, we, we also have a psychologist here. And this is one of these very highfalutin Harley Street uh, operations. He says, well, why is that? He says, because if you're over 55 and you come in for me to examine you, I will always find something. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Whether you come in you know, for your liver, I'll find something in your kidneys, because it's just, it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure if I investigated you hard enough, you know, if your lawyers are watching, I'm not making accusations, but I'm sure I'd find, you know, investigate me. Maybe in my liver, but not in my <laughs> bank account. That wouldn't take yeah, you two you minutes. Know, but, you know, you know, also when you run a big operation, yeah. like, like, you know, Donald Trump did, I'm sure there's there's something in there somewhere, you know. Uh, and I, again, I'm not making accusations mm. Ag against mm. the president. Now, now, so Rex Tillerson is out. Mm. He'll be fine, as we concluded. What can you tell us about his replacement? Oh, Pompeo is is a, you know a very good, uh, a, a very great, a good man at the CIA. And I think again, he is someone that is really on Trump's page. You know, there's several people there that Trump admires, gets along with. Pompeo is one. Uh, General Mattis is another one. Uh, I think um, uh, General Kelly. I mean, he, he, he likes the, you know, these generals. He likes army men, which, you know, uh, General Kelly, he's, he's had his little tiffs with, but again, he respects guys in the military. And these, these are sort of like, you know, his sort of guys. Uh, so I think Pompeo, and again, I think Pompeo well, has done a good job, you know. Charles, you'll be own. hoping that these are not the last days of Pompeo. <laughs> Thanks for coming on this point. Or Trumpo. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm beginning to think Trump is trying an experiment in widening participation in government, as at this rate, every living American will have had a go in the White House administration by the end of his four years. Sure, he's not been there long and he's been through record numbers of staff. Maybe he'll even fire himself by Twitter <laughs> one day. <laughs> well, that's all the time we've got for the tweets today. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today, or on Twitter and Instagram, RT underscore Sputnik. Goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous. <laughs>